there's a big, big difference between getting through a workout and performing to your maximal potential. That Triathlon Show, episode 100. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and today's episode is one of the follow-up episodes that I promised in episodes 94 and 95. We return once again to the topic of uh, nutrition, and this time, specifically, what are the research-based recommendations for nutrition before, during, and after workouts? So, as you remember, in last episode, we also had uh, Monique Ryan on. And talked about nutrition so it's a big nutrition week and uh, with episodes 94 and 95 also being on that topic it's been quite a lot of that recently which uh, uh, is it's just a random coincidence really but uh, from my my podcasting scheduling but I think it's fine because there's a ton of noise to cut through with this topic and uh, yeah I've kind of made it my mission to to do so try to cut through some of the noise at least so uh, really separating the fads from the facts and as I record this I just spent some time looking at what people are writing and doing in terms of like social media and nutrition coaching in various uh, endurance groups on Facebook and as usual that just made me cringe and I feel so sorry for the people that are receivers of all this probably well-meaning but completely unfounded advice that uh, is definitely not fact-based so that's what uh, I hope that for you listeners that I can help clear up some of the confusion because nutrition is a topic that we know a lot about. Compared to training, there are a lot of more questions than answers really about how to train. We we don't. There are many good ways to train, but all of that is really almost a lot of it. I should say is anecdotal evidence, and and there, there's, it has been really difficult to study things like optimal training protocols. Strength training is the exception there. But uh, nutrition is something where we have a lot of answers and uh, and not quite as many answers as questions, but we do have a lot of answers and a pretty clear picture of what to do in terms of endurance sports nutrition. So there's no need to complicate things and try to come up with new secrets. There's a lot of marketing hype going on. So yeah, this episode is uh, another another part of trying to cut through some of that noise and that's my rant over hopefully for this episode. Before we dive into the main topic I want to say a big thank you to all of you whether you're a new listener welcome along and if you've been listening for a long time uh, thank you so much for sticking with me and this podcast for 100 episodes and for being a loyal listener I really 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 appreciate it I appreciate all the interaction I had with you guys in the comments on the show notes pages in emails on twitter it's uh, super awesome to to hear from you and and hear that you're enjoying the podcast and, and keep sending me feedback and suggestions I always want to keep improving it and uh, if you want to help me then obviously spreading the word about the podcast uh, it still has a lot of room to grow believe me there are a lot of people that don't know about it so that's uh, that let's uh, yeah uh, that would be really great if you could help me do that and I will make sure that we reach 200 episodes a little less than a year from now. So, uh, let's go into the main topic, but first, let's thank our sponsors, Precision Hydration. One size does not fit all when it comes to hydration, and you could easily lose multiple times the amount of sodium that your training partner does. So, that is why Precision Hydration offer products of various strengths to match your results from the free online sweat test that you can take on precisionhydration.com. And until the end of February, you can get your first box for free by using the discount code DATTRIATHLONSHOW, all one word, when you check out on precisionhydration.com. 
This episode is also sponsored by Triathlon Corner, a triathlon webshop on triathlon-corner.store. If you're in the market for anything from running shoes to wetsuits to power meters and bike computers, they've got it and they have great prices, plenty of great deals and of course they ship worldwide, so check them out on triathlon-corner.store. All right, let's get into the main topic for today, nutrition before, during and after workouts. So let me first repeat a little bit of background from episodes 94 and 95, both of which I've linked to in the episode description. They are called Triathlon Nutrition, Calories, Carbs, Fats and Protein, uh, parts 1 and 2. And the evidence base for them, as well as for today's episode, is the uh, position standpoint or joint position statement, I should say, called Nutrition and Athletic Performance, which was, was published in Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise in 2016 and uh, I won't cover the authors and the reviewers but there are a lot of them they're very credible so it's a great great uh, source of evidence and they've reviewed all the available research on the topics that they that they cover in that in that position statement so uh, yeah that's that's where the evidence come from and I've also listed some of the key publications that they reference uh, in the episode description and in the show notes on thattriathlonshow.com if you want to check the original sources. So as I'm sure you're aware anybody probably know, knows this intuitively and most of us have experienced it if you haven't eaten properly and had appropriate nutrition leading up to workout or potentially during a workout, then that can lead to to decreases in your performance, your power, your endurance, and things like skill and concentration as well during or throughout or towards the end of of any workout. So, So that's the reasons are many but the most common ones are glycogen depletion or hypoglycemia or dehydration or electrolyte imbalances those are usually the most common ones but another one that's worth mentioning is gastrointestinal discomfort so if you have you maybe have fueled but you chose the wrong the wrong thing to fuel with the wrong food to eat before the workout and and then that gastrointestinal discomfort may may cause you to not have the best and most pleasant of experiences in your workout so so that's uh, the basis for why we need to to be mindful and uh, be particular about how we how we eat and how we hydrate and and what we supplement with before during and after workouts so let's start with before and uh, i'm going to talk about hydration first here uh, that's one of the key things and that's something that uh, that is easy to to get wrong and, and forget about. Many athletes actually start their workouts in an already somewhat dehydrated uh, state or technically more correct hypohydrated state and that reduces performance. That's uh, uh, a fact. Now I'm not going to state anymore that things are facts or not. I'm just going to, to read things that I've taken notes from, from the position statement here and summarize them in a, an easy to consume way. So, But yeah, this is not just my opinions, just to make that clear. And, and the reasons for that reduced endurance performance is that your blood plasma volume decreases and that leads to increased cardiovascular strain and uh, increased glycogen utilization plus altered metabolic and central nervous system functions and increased body temperature. So there are a lot of things going on there if you're dehydrated, which means that you, you have to hydrate well. This isn't complicated. It's not very uncomplicated you just need to make sure that uh, your urine is a pale color it can be a pale yellow color not completely transparent but but pale and hydrate well in the two to four hours before exercise leave enough time to get rid of excess fluid that's a good uh, good tip or you might have uh, an unpleasant exercise and another one a final tip is to include some sodium in your pre-workout fluids or foods because that can help with fluid retention and uh, there is a lot of a lot of people that lose a lot of sodium in 
in their uh, in their sweat, as uh, you know, because you listen to this show and you hear me talk about precision hydration. Uh, so I actually check them out on precisionhydration.com to take your free online sweat test. But uh, including some sodium either in fluids or in foods, that definitely helps with uh, fluid retention. And what about nutrition? It's mostly carbohydrates that we need to consider before the workouts. The reason that pre-fueling with carbs is important is is that one of the main causes of fatigue and reduced uh, performance, whether it's power or pace, however you want to, to measure it, is depletion of muscle glycogen. And also, unless the central nervous system, and that's uh, in uh, particular the brain, has uh, enough carbs available, then that will fatigue. And this leads to a whole host of performance reducing consequences that are, some of them are like physiological, like you reduced power and things like that, but then also impaired pacing and uh, technique, concentration, all those sorts of things, plus increased perception of effort. And that's something that you've heard us talk about before many times. Episode 17, highly recommend it. Check that out. But uh, yeah, so what you need to do is uh, essentially make sure that you have enough uh, enough carbs available. And again, I want to make a distinction here. Carbs does not equal grains. There are healthy carbs and there are unhealthy carbs. I'm not saying that grains are unhealthy necessarily, but you don't have to feel like you need to go out and, and eat bowls and bowls of pasta every day. That's that's definitely not the point I'm trying to make here. You can you can get by on just eating fruits and vegetables. Uh, you need to eat a lot of them in that case, but but that's totally fine. So you you need and you also need to consider the duration of your workout or your race. If it if you have a normal low intensity workout that lasts 60 minutes or less or so then uh, you you can just eat what you would eat on a normal rest day essentially and and that's probably going to be enough to make sure that you have enough glycogen available but for longer workouts or workouts around 60 minutes that have a significant amount of intensity like an interval workout then you'll want to consume one to four grams of carbs per kilogram body weight in the one to four hours before the workout so that's a specific piece of advice for you and a specific guideline for you to follow obviously for shorter workouts or less intense workouts you can stay in that lower range or lower end of the range but uh, if you have a long workout or a really really hard workout then uh, definitely going towards that higher end of the range is uh, advisable so that would for example mean that if you weigh 70 kilograms and you have a medium duration with some moderate intensity workout then maybe two and a half grams per uh, per kilogram body weight so so that that would be two and a half times 70 i should have picked a, an easier example 175 grams of carbs so so that would that's a, that's a, a lot so that probably means that you need to actually have a meal in the one to four hours what i would do is uh, is i would probably have a have a meal two or three hours before and maybe also have a snack one hour or less than one hour before like a banana or something but if you just need the those that one gram of carbs per kilogram body weight then you can usually get away with like just a snack uh, that that can be a banana for example that's my go-to at least and it's important here that even if you don't feel that you need to consume carbs before your workout to to do it to get through it there's a big big difference between getting through a workout and performing to your maximal potential. Uh, I need to make that clear. Here I'm talking about performance, nutrition for endurance performance. I'm not talking about nutrition to getting through workouts. Uh, you, you can get through a lot without having any sort of consideration to, to how you eat before or during the workout. And that's just a little bit of grit and, and a lot is possible, but your intensity will suffer and what you get out of it will will suffer as a consequence so if if you really want to make sure that you get the most bang for your training buck then follow these guidelines and uh, you will do you will do better there's plenty of research showing that that having carbohydrates plenty of carbohydrate available increases performance in in exercise so what should that uh, that fuel or that nutrition that food consist of in general you want low fat content and low fiber content 
and either low or maybe moderate protein content uh, because all of these things can potentially cause gastrointestinal problems and promote gastric emptying but uh, it should be said that uh, another thing that this at, at least surprised me a bit because i was under the impression that that if you consume like a snack one hour before a workout a hard workout you want uh, a high glycemic index uh, carbohydrate type of food but actually the position statement had found that neither the glycemic load nor glycemic index of carbohydrate rich meals affect the metabolic nor performance outcomes of training once carbohydrate and energy content of the diet have been taken into account. So you can just as well eat a can of beans as you can eat a bowl of pasta, for example, to, to make things clear and understandable. And that was something that was new to me. So, so I started using that a lot. So now these days, for example, if I for my afternoon workout, I often have a lunch salad, which uh, it has a lot of carbs because I have a lot of fruits in it and, and a lot of vegetables, but most of the carbs come from the fruits. And, and often I also have quite a bit of beans i can have a lot of beans in it actually but anyway those aren't the things that i maybe in the past would have had because i would have considered that if i have a workout in the afternoon then i i would want something that is a bit higher on the on the glycemic index than than the, especially the the vegetables uh, but uh but I've actually found that, uh, well, my, my stomach tolerates it. And, and since getting to know that that isn't really an issue, how high or low GI, glycemic index, the carb is, it doesn't really matter a lot. But staying in that range one to four hour, that helps you make sure that your body absorbs the carbs enough. And obviously you need to consider those high GI foods may be easier on your stomach if your stomach is sensitive to GI issues. Uh, now I'm talking gastrointestinal and not glycemic index. It's a bit confusing. Uh, so sorry about that. I'll try to be clearer. But uh, the point here is that you can eat clean carbs uh, like fruit, like sweet potato, like a bowl of lentils, whatever it is, if uh, if that's your preference and you will have no uh, performance detriments from not having those super high glycemic index foods. So So that's definitely something that's important to know. The time that you consume your pre-exercise meal does matter. I would probably, if you consume something like one hour or less than one hour even before the workout, uh, then I would go with like something like a banana, which is high glycemic index and uh, easy to absorb. But if you're eating something two or three hours before, then that beans too might be perfectly, perfectly fine. So a few examples. Uh, what I, as I said, what I do these days often is that, uh, well, for morning workouts, I we have a hard long swim, so so I do have breakfast before, and that can be a fruit and uh, either some oatmeal with yogurt and some berries and things like that. So yeah, that's a common one, and coffee, of course, coffee. But for afternoon workouts, I tend to have lunch two to three hours before, and that can be that salad that I mentioned. And uh, but if, and then for some workouts where I just need a snack. Then a banana. If I need a larger snack, then I go for two bananas. So I'm a, I'm a banana guy, definitely. Uh, but uh, sometimes I even have, if I have a workout like or eat something really shortly before the workout, then that's a good time to have some bread, I think, because that's something that I definitely know that my stomach can tolerate no matter what. And and, and if you, you're not following that one to four hour, you're below that one hour, then that's some a place where we're following that higher gi carb uh, intake guideline may be may be beneficial i don't actually know because the position statement doesn't say anything about that but that's what i've assumed before and known from before i think dates are another good option and even leftovers again probably staying in that one to four hour window and not going too close but leftovers from last day last day's dinner or some sports drink. Uh, again, if you're having your snack just before, like 15 minutes before, a sports drink is a great option. Obviously, it all depends on your workout, how much you're having, and what you're having as well to some extent. Because, for example, a very high-intensity workout, you will need to be very uh, considerate, probably, a lot of you, with uh, minimizing fiber and fat and even protein content. But for a less intense workout that's just long, let's say you have a long ride, then that's not maybe an issue so much and you, you can do that just fine without any GI issues. 
All right, so uh, that's it for before workouts, really. So let's next talk about how to fuel during workouts. And uh, this all starts, it, it again has hydration and uh, carbohydrates as the things to consider. You don't need to consider and shouldn't consider fat and protein here. Let's start with carbohydrates this time. Uh, if your workout is uh, 75 minutes or longer, or even if it's a highly intense workout in the 45 to 75 minute range, it has been repeatedly shown that uh, you improve your performance in the workouts by taking on carbs during the exercise. For reasons that I just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. So one of in most cases you would actually consume the carbs but one thing that i want to mention is that actually for reducing perception of effort through the activation of reward centers in your brain that's something that you can do with just mouth rinsing and th there's a lot more research coming out and has been coming out about that in recent years and it seems like really that it, that it actually works really great you you can just take some sports drink and rinse it in your mouth or or gel and then spit it out with with some water and and that actually helps you improve performance so that's that's another option that you have and maybe especially if you have i, I would imagine that the best use case for that would be if you have a really sensitive stomach or you're having some gi issues but you still want to make sure that you don't uh, allow your performance to decline too much or if you are in a weight loss phase and you want to minimize, usually uh, during, before, during or after workouts is not the time to consider your weight loss. But in some cases, if you can get away with only mouth rinsing in, for example, a short one hour intense workout instead of taking on extra, extra carbs, then uh, that might be actually a good option for you. That would, that would be something that, that I would consider actually a good, good use of mouth rinsing. So, so that's an option that you have. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a bit of a side note, but uh, still, no, well, it's still highly re relevant. But uh, let's now move on to talk about uh, actually consuming carbs like sports drinks and gels. And during exercise, definitely the recommendation is to usually have some sort of, uh, of sports uh, products because they are actually designed pretty pretty well these days to be absorbed quickly and uh, and to bring you the maximum amount of carbs in the shortest amount of time so there's a reason re reason to get them in and uh, and you are using do not they are they just stay in your bloodstream and and your exercise and your muscles will take up the glycogen and use it to to create energy to create atp to move you forward so you don't need to consider anything like like sugar load it's during exercise it's completely different if you have sports drink in the evening watching tv that's not something you should do but during exercise that's what it's made for and there are no detriments really to it so again okay here's uh, i'm going to list out the different windows if you, let's say you have a less than one hour or 45 minutes and less uh it depends a bit on the person but yeah let, let's call it less than an hour exercise and uh, not much of intensity then uh, you don't need and shouldn't take on carbohydrate if you have a high intensity exercise in the okay 45 to 75 minute range i think i took these notes directly from the position statement so i'm just going to stick to them then you should it's recommended to consume small amounts of carbs so uh, up to 30 gram, grams per hour and as a reference point uh, one gel it uh, varies a bit but usually you can count on a gel having maybe 22 grams of carbs or something along those lines so having one gel that might be fine or a bottle of sports drinks they usually have 20 to 30 grams per 500 milliliters so that's another good option or as i said you could just mouth rinse so if you have uh, an uh, a workout that's uh, an hour to two and a half hours long and it's uh uh, then your carbohydrate needs increase a little bit to 30 to 60 grams per hour. And that's, for example, a bottle of sports drinks and one energy gel per hour. So, so it's not that much and you need that hydration anyway, as we'll get on to. And finally, in long duration endurance workouts that are two and a half hours or more, up to 90 grams per per hour is uh, the recommended carb intake to, to have a minimal, minimally reduced 
performance and that uh, equates to a bottle of sports drinks and two to three energy gels per hour. So, so that those are some examples and some easy to follow guidelines and it's nothing extreme. And one important thing to point out about this up to 90 grams per hour, you really won't get any extra benefits by going higher than that because you you can't absorb any more than, than that really that has been shown. So there is uh, actually one in interesting point in the position statement is that they found that Though you know you've seen those gels with dual source carb mix, so they contain both glucose and fructose, and the idea is that they should be absorbed faster than uh, gels containing, for example, just glucose. But uh, this review, based on uh, the research that they analyzed, they stated that it hasn't been conclusively shown yet. So, so that's a very interesting point, and obviously uh, it's uh, worth pointing out. Uh, but that said. I checked an article by Asker Jokendrup, the world leading nutrition researcher, and while he agreed on almost every single other point in the position statement, he disagrees with, with that conclusion and he stated that even if the conclusions that they made about the metabolic effects were correct, uh, then there were at least three studies showing direct performance improvements when using dual source supplements. Uh, like like those glucose plus fructose gels, for example. So so the point being that maybe we don't know exactly why it works, but uh, but it works. The performance is improved. So my recommendation would be to, in this case, uh, don't go with the position statement, but go with Asker Jokendrup and uh, use dual source carb mixes if you if you can. That's uh, definitely what I do. All right. So hydration during workouts. You know, because you listen obviously to episode 49 with Andy Blow from Precision Hydration, that sweat rates, they vary a lot. So for example, from depending on the weather, the individual and the workout intensity, sweat rates can vary from, from anything uh, between uh, 0.3 to 2.4 liters per hour. So that's a massive, that's an eight time difference. And uh, you don't want to lose too much uh, fluid period because if you lose according to this position statement again i know that andy recently wrote a blog post on this topic and, and he suggested that losing two to five percent is uh, is okay but not more than that uh, this position statement they stated that losing more than two percent of body weight by not drinking enough can reduce performance and uh, and even cognitive function like concentration and especially in hot weather and uh, yeah, I know that Haile Gebre Selassie lo lost 10% of, of body weight when he set the world record. There are exceptions. That, that's definitely true. But uh, these exceptions seem to mostly occur actually in elite athletes and even in specific subgroups like the East African runners because they, they seem to never really practice drinking during workouts. So that may play into the fact that they can lose more sweat and still perform. So, so that's interesting. But uh, the general more, more common range, average range of sweat loss is usually uh, 0.4 to 0.8 liters per hour. And you can obviously easily calculate this by weighing yourself in the nude before and after a training session and calculate the difference in weight, add back any fluid you took in during the exercise if you, if you did take on any fluid. And, and then divide uh, this... Uh, amount of, uh, of weight that you lost, which is uh, sweat, obviously, by the time in hours that you were out and you will get your hourly sweat rate. And it's worth repeating this test multiple, multiple times at different intensities and in different weather conditions uh, and other environmental conditions to, to get to, to get your because it's not a fixed number there are, you will have several sweat rates depending on those those considerations that I just mentioned so so do that multiple times and and that will give you help give you a gauge on, on how much you sweat and how much you should take on but again you can lose enough sweat that uh, that your body weight decreases to two percent and and that's totally fine no performance decrease but beyond that there may be performance uh, declines. So in addition to, to the actual fluid water itself, then sodium, as we talked about, and other electrolytes are critical and you lose them in your sweat and it the concentration varies from person to person. 
So for example, the average concentration may be approximately one gram per liter, but depending on the individual, it can vary from 0.5 to 2.0. So that's again, a four time difference between individuals potentially. And uh, losing too much electrolytes, that it can lead to uh, declined performance, obviously, that's, uh, that's one thing. And it can be very, very significant. And also cramps, that's one of the topics that we talked about with Andy in episode 49. They, they are usually caused by muscle fatigue, but several other factors like uh, electrolyte depletion and sodium depletion and dehydration have been associated with, with cramps. So especially for heavy sweaters, and if you have a high sweat sodium concentration, you definitely are at a greater risk of cramping if you don't hydrate properly and you don't also consider your sodium intake, not, not just dehydration. Because the amount of sodium that exists in normal sports drinks, that may not be appropriate for you. It, uh, it can be good if you're a reasonably low uh, sweat sodium content sweater or low sweater overall. Uh, but, uh, but if you are a bit of a heavier sweater, then definitely you might need to supplement, especially as the workouts get, get longer and longer. And if you are planning something like a half Ironman or a full Ironman, then this is something that you should carefully plan out or ask your coach to help you with, uh, because this becomes really a critical piece of the puzzle. It's not, it should not be an afterthought. And that's, uh, I guess, the main main point here. In, in in this section on on hydration and sodium and i definitely it's not just because they sponsored the episode but precision hydration is a fantastic company and their free online sweat test is really great uh, i use their products all the time when i go out on on long or long-ish rides uh, so i'm not running much at the moment but i will be using it when when i get back to running longer than 30 minutes at a time uh, obviously and I probably should use it in swimming because you swim for a long time and I don't and I don't know why that's probably stupid but anyway they have this free online sweat test on precisionhydration.com and it's also linked to in the episode description where you can find a very good very accurate ballpark estimate for uh, how much you sweat and how much sodium your sweat contains just based on qualitative questions but they have validated this based on on people that they have actually sweat tested with a machine that can measure super accurately it's like a medical device the the sweat rate and the sweat sodium content so so it's a validated sweat test that you can take and that will help you then plan your both your hydration but also whether you need to supplement with extra sodium in in workouts. So I think that's about it for the during workouts. I'm just checking my notes here again. Yeah, yeah, that's... A, well, one thing that I could mention is actually how do I myself fuel? I mentioned that I use precision hydration. Let's say I go for a three-hour long ride. I will have three bottles with me. It will be two and a half liters, so so 0.8 liters per hour is usually what I drink, and and that will be precision hydration based on uh, on my sweat sodium content, and and I will so I won't take on any carbs through the fuel because that is just an electrolyte subtle, electrolyte supplement, so all the carbs I'll take on will be through gels or maybe sometimes an, uh, a bar. Uh, it can be nice to have a bar at least if it's uh, yeah it depends a bit sometimes I do that so normally I would I actually especially if it's a group ride because the culture here is a bit different so a lot of the people here don't take almost any energy so I feel weird to <laughs> following my own guidelines a bit so so that has made me stay on a lower end of the range so maybe if I would stay in the uh, uh, on the higher end like the 80 grams per hour before I'm now more on the 60 grams per hour but uh, but, but probably somewhere around that 50 to 60 grams per hour is where I am now with with the gels that I take I, I I take on gels and usually they're isotonic gels of some sort but not always and and then also an energy bar so that would be a couple of gels per hour plus one bar over the course of that three hour ride so that's that's just my personal example and i hope that that can be be helpful for somebody and and that's not like a super intense ride for a super intense ride i would probably make sure that i'm uh, closer to that 90 grams 
as opposed to uh, to those 50 to 60 grams per hour, which is on the low end of the recommended. All right, let's move on to after exercise um, and what you should do then. And carbs and hydration come in again, but now we also need to consider protein. That's uh, the final one. And again, some general things that you consider here. After the exercise, this is really, you have this window of opportunity where you can, you're going to metabolize a lot of energy and you need to give the body a lot of energy to allow it to rebuild quickly and rebound quickly and recover quickly. So so it's it's good to try to time your workouts with your meals of the day. That's something that I try to do if possible sometimes. But otherwise you need to have a post-workout snack. That's perfectly fine as well. And uh, you can use like all of the things that you need you can get from normal foods so so it, you don't need a shake that's uh, that's but shakes are there's nothing wrong with them at all and sometimes they're great for uh, portability and and they have what you need but is if you check that it's like an endurance sports shake or that you modify it accordingly because the resistance training recovery shakes they have too much protein compared to carbs for endurance athletes but anyway Shakes are good, but but you don't have to have a shake. You can have normal food. You can have fruit. You can have those clean carbs. You can have clean protein and uh, and and hydrate with water and some sodium. Uh, so so that's uh, one important thing to to point out here. But one other thing that's also important is that if your workout isn't intense and it's uh, an hour or shorter, then you don't necessarily need to consider post exercise nutrition at all. However. I would encourage you because this is when nutrients are least likely to be converted to and stored as fat. Uh, th- this is definitely I, I would time my workouts so that even if you have an easy workout, you have a snack or a meal that you would have anyway right after that because then you'll get the most bang for your nutrition. You will be most effective at uh, at metabolizing burning burning through calories, put simply, and make it easier to to stay at racing weight or reach your racing weight if that's your goal. So let's now consider carbohydrates again first because that is the most important thing in uh, post-exercise nutrition is glycogen restoration because you have used a lot of glycogen during the the workout and uh, your body's normal rate of glycogen resynthesis is only 5% per hour so as triathletes we train quite a lot and especially if the workout was intense or moderate to long duration you have a lot of glycogen that you need to restore and you definitely have to speed up this process to be ready for your next workout by consuming carbs and and without qu- that quick restoration then uh, your both your recovery from the session will take longer and your performance in in the next workout may be may be impaired so so that's really really important so here's the guideline 1 to 1.2 grams of carbs per kilogram body weight per hour during the four, first 4 to 6 hours after exercise maximizes the effective refueling time so let's break that down again 70 kilogram person 1 to 1.2 grams of carbs per kilogram per hour that translates to 70 to 70 no, 70 to 84 grams of carbs per hour. So for the first four to six hours. So let's uh, use four as an example. 70 to 70 to 84, that 70 times four is 280. You can see that I didn't calculate this in advance, <laughs> can't you? And 84 times four will be 332. So 280 to 332 grams of, uh, of carbs during the first four to six hours. And that, again, means that you should have a meal in that time uh, and but this as i said research has shown that the sources can be can be anything really it, it can be very healthy healthy carbs as long as uh, you make sure that you get the amount of carbs needed and your energy intake overall is adequate and, and you meet your other nutritional goals then uh, then anything from Chocolate milk right after we work out is a good option, but, but it's definitely not the be all end all. But uh, also fruits or quinoa bowl are just as fine. So, but but again, bear in mind this is what the nutrition statement more so took into account those first four to six hours. But there is also 
quite a lot of research on that first one hour or even 30 minutes so consider that make sure that you get quite a bit of carbs in during that first part maybe even half of those carbs during that first hour or first half hour is po if possible after your workout next we have protein and uh, protein is really really important the thing to remember here is that you don't necessarily need as much as uh, some people and uh, marketing hype would have you believe, but you need it. And, uh, and consuming it shortly after your workout definitely enhances the muscle protein synthesis. We talked about that in episode 95. So, and if you consume it together with your carbs post-exercise, that also may support the glycogen synthesis. So... It's an additive effect there, a synergistic effect. So that's that's really, really good to consume carbohydrate, but include some protein with, with it. And the amount that you should uh, consume is uh, recommended to be in the 0.25 to 0.3 grams per kilogram body weight. Uh, so that for most body sizes, relatively normal triathlon body sizes, that would be somewhere in the range of 15 to 25 grams of protein. I did calculate that one in advance, so uh, <laughs> that was good. And, and that would be in the early phases, like up to two hours after exercise is what the position statement says. I personally, I, I try to front load everything and keep it within the first hour. Uh, not, not everything, uh, I need to rephrase that, but actually consume a lot of these two hour or four to six hour window, uh, this energy, whether it's carbs or protein that I need as close as possible to the workout. Not everything, but but quite a lot. So, so have a, a decent size post-workout meal or snack or whatever it is. But here with protein, going back to that, 15 to 25 grams, that's not a lot. 20 grams is a scoop of protein, usually, if you use like a whey protein. And uh, higher doses are not really that much better. So there's not much more that the body will absorb really and use for muscle protein synthesis. So no need to go overboard with post-workout protein. And that's why also why you need to not use resistant training recovery shakes but either use uh, a ready-made product for uh, endurance sports. I think Science in Sports has one that uh, I think is really good. Uh, it can be expensive, but sometimes you can get it for cheap when they have promos. Uh, and also you can mix your own uh, mix of whey protein and maltodextrin, and that's really cheap, and that way you can get your, your own tailor-made post-workout snack. So finally, hydration after exercise. You lost some sweat, you probably lost 2% of body weight maybe, and, uh, and your sweat loss and urine loss is going to continue at a greater rate than normal after workouts actually. So you should take in a greater amount of fluid than your fluid deficit from the workout. So as an example, if you know that your sweat rate is 2 liters per hour and you work out for an hour but consumed 500 milliliters of fluid, then you have a deficit of 1.5 liter. So, so then you could aim to consume 120, 125 to 150% of this deficit, 1.9 to 2.3 liters in the post-workout phase. That again would be probably a couple or three hours or so. You don't need to immediately gulp down two big bottles of water, but, but you need to, to make sure that you get in that amount in, in the hours following. So yeah, just keep it at a modest rate uh, because that, that minimizes the need to go to the bathroom as well, uh, which just forces you to get rid of the fluid right away. And also remember that sodium, uh, in, whether you include electrolytes, something like a precision hydration uh, product, or, or you include a bit of sodium in your food, you can even put, I like to put sea salt in my post-workout smoothies. That's uh, really good and it doesn't make it taste salt, salty at all. So so adding that sodium again after workouts in, uh, in a modest amount, that helps with fluid retention again. So... Uh, so this is this is really good, important for quickly restoring your blood plasma volume, which you want to get up again, so you're ready to perform in your subsequent workouts. Uh, that's uh, one of the main main purposes of the post workout hydration. So uh, no need to restrict your sodium intake, at least in your 
post-workout nutrition if you're somebody who is uh, trying to restrict it in in some other cases, which I know is pretty common. And one final thing, uh, avoid excess intake of alcohol uh, in your post-workout hydration window uh, because it uh, will impair and slow the rehydration process with its diuretic effects. That's something that the position statement said, actually. So uh, that's uh, about it. I think one, yeah, a personal example again for this one. Uh, I like to again try to time my workout so that I actually eat a meal right after. Uh, for my morning workouts, I have breakfast both before and after. So I have a uh, I have a breakfast before my swim, but then a big breakfast after my my swim, and and then other workouts. Depending on when I do them, I usually have a pretty early dinner after I have a, an afternoon ride, for example. So or a lunch if it's a weekend day, then I I would go out and ride in the morning and then have lunch after that. So that's uh, that's what I do these days mostly. But uh, I've also used a lot of smoothies especially in the past and i want to get back to that again pretty soon like just having uh, a mix of fruits a little bit of whey protein uh, not a little bit like enough an adequate amount of whey protein i should say and and fluid adding that sea salt uh, that's uh, yeah that's really good one thing to bear in mind is that you don't want to add necessarily add that much fat whatever your post-workout meal is because that can slow down the absorption of carbohydrate so at least in that first window one hour window then don't try to limit the amount of fat that you have so because i know that for example i love adding dates to my smoothies but that's something that i don't generally do in uh, in the post-workout smoothies because they have some fat so i i'd rather go for a banana based smoothie or something something like that All right, so I hope that you enjoyed this episode. There will be at least one more follow-up episode like this on nutrition based on the joint position statement. And that one will be on body composition uh, for endurance athletes. So that is to follow in uh, an upcoming episode. I think it will be something like maybe episode 108 or something like that. So so you have to have to wait for a month or so probably, but, but not too long. So there will be uh, some great interviews coming in between th- that and and now. Of course, as usual, I want you to check out the show notes for this episode on thattriathlonshow.com and please add your comments, your questions. If there's anything that's unclear, post that in the comment section and I'll get back to you and reply. And that also allows anybody else who has the same question to see my answer to that. Uh, and one other important update that I did on my website, actually, on scientifictriathlon.com, is that I added category pages. So, for example, now I have a page specifically on nutrition. So uh, you can find it in the main navigation menu on scientifictriathlon.com. I'll also re- link directly to the nutrition page in the episode description here. But basically, that is where I have collected all of my resources on nutrition so mostly podcast episodes but for nutrition i put together a resource that makes this position statement easy to understand quickly and translates it into practical terms has tables with those guidelines and things like that you can access that as well from that page Uh, again it's linked to in the episode description but as well all the backlog of podcast episodes that i've done on nutrition will be on or they are already on that page. It's already up. <laughs> Would you believe it? Because I'm usually late with putting up things like that, that I promise. Anyway, I also have similar pages on swimming, biking, running, strength training, science, probably something else as well that I don't remember off the top of my head. And it's the popular topics tab in uh, uh, in the what is it called? The navigation menu. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I also have a beginner's tips page. Yeah, that's the final one. And I'm going to add some more topics soon, like psychology, I think I'll add, and and maybe something else that uh, I can think of. So go and check those out. And that's where you can find, like, for example, the podcast episodes that interest your specific current interest. If it's swimming, you can find all my swimming episodes quickly and easily right there. Finally, thank you for sponsoring this episode to Triathlon Corner, the new online home of shopping the best triathlon products to great prices with worldwide shipping. Find them on triathlon-corner.store. 
And thank you to Precision Hydration, who have a lot, a lot, a lot of great free advice that is research-based. I love their blog because it's actually, they do what I try to do as well and stay to the facts and stick uh, stick to the facts and stay away from the fads what was what i was trying to say uh, so go to precisionhydration.com click hydration advice that's the name of their blog and that's where you can read all of those episodes like for example the recent one on uh, on dehydration like that andy said that two percent is fine and probably even up to five percent may be okay for athletes so so yeah, uh, you can check that out. And if you get your first box of Precision Hydration product, use the discount code or free product code, that triathlon show, all one word, to get your first box for free. If you've already got, you're already an existing customer, then you'll get 15% off. Thank you, as always, for listening. And if you haven't listened to all 100 episodes, then uh, I encourage you to do some catching up on them. And in the meantime, keep training smart and keep loving triathlon. <laughs>